Separated because there's an angry pig out back who likes to attack my dogs. All right, so today we're gonna be doing something a little different. So, this is a cage that needs to be fixed, it's broken in two spots. Both doors are broken, so both need to be replaced. I do believe Exoterra does sell the doors rather than buy the entire enclosure again. If not, then I'm gonna go ahead and fix it myself. All it requires is a couple of tabs up top so the door can swing so I don't have to tape it. But having said that, there are some voids in the cage. I don't trust it. I have to empty all this out. This used to be a bioactive setup for my satanic leaf tail geckos and my spear point leaf tail geckos. Um, as of late, it's been a place, well, at least at the other houses where the Tokay gecko stayed. Now the Tokay is in a different space, but I want to do an em uh, <sighs> We learn how to speak. I want to do an episode with you guys on something that uh, interests me in the fullest. It's more animal behavior style shit than it is uh, really learning about something. But then we're going to rebuild this enclosure to a bioactive setup. I don't even know how these plants are surviving. Honestly, they're probably just really tough plants and they're outdoors, but everything else has died. The ficus died out. Everything died out from the move and all that good stuff. So. Got to replace all this, take all this stuff out. You can see that we have the substrate on the bottom, a little lava rocks, there's some screen on top of that, then our soil on top, which is dried out. And then we removed all the isopods and spring tails that we could and pretty much gave those to other people so that they could use them for their bioactives. Because with the soil drying out, me not on top of the cage, we don't have the light, we don't have the structure, we have nothing for them to eat except for all the leaf litter now, um, those would have died out as well. So we're gonna be rebuilding this bioactive setup. We're gonna get rid of this back wall. We're gonna get rid of all this shit in here and we're gonna start from the ground up. So I'm gonna show you guys how to build a bioactive and we're gonna do it for a species that to me is vastly underrated. It's my absolute favorite gecko on the planet. Um, that I'll stand by. It's been my favorite gecko since I was a kid. And we're gonna do an episode on that today. And then later on uh, this week, once I figure out how I'm gonna deal with these doors, we're gonna go ahead and show you how to build a bioactive from the ground up. And we're gonna get rid of this background. We're gonna do our own background. So we're gonna show you guys all that as well. So let's fucking get started. Boom. All right, dudes and dudettes. So um, this is actually gonna be a fun, this is gonna be a fun one for me. So I have two of my favorite species of uh, lizard sitting here. One of them fairly expensive, one of them far more rare than the other. This is just a temporary cage I picked up from Josh the other day when I was over at Cold Blooded Kingdom. He had one sitting outside. And rather than chance what you guys just saw and have my gecko getting out, we got this. Now, the gecko's stressed because he's usually in the garage outside, but the garage outside has not been escape proofed yet, and there's a bunch of shit that I need to get out from the old owners. I need to move some stuff around. He can get behind anything really quickly, so. Basically what I'm going to do is a very generic episode. Uh, I'm going to teach you some stuff that I do know about these guys. This one being my favorite just because of so many information that's out there. Um, but this by far, we'll do this one first because my buddy Lewis stopped by because he's going to be bringing this to somebody. So we got the pleasure of hanging out with something that I haven't got to see in a little while. And the whole episode is basically going to be uh, essentially, a lot of people ask me, how do you tame down an animal? How do you tame down a lizard, snake, whatever it may be? And it all goes back to time spent. Um, with some of the reptiles, there are some, there, some techniques that I do use that can help. Whether or not it's 
a format that is usable universally. You know, oh my God. Let's see if I can learn how to speak today. Dude, you gotta bear with me. I've been running on like no sleep whatsoever. This is like the third time I've tried to do this specific video and I'm lucky enough now that, that Lewis has stopped by. By the way, Lewis is my cameraman for today. So, haha, big boy. Um, he doesn't like to be on the camera anyway, but if you want to check him out, Birds and Exotics of the World, that's on Instagram. He doesn't do the YouTube thing, uh, but he's got some amazing stuff that you guys can look at over there. He is a falconer, so there's that. So you can do uh, with him, if you join him, you can usually see a bunch of stuff about falconry, a bunch of beautiful birds, and then he also travels often. He was just with Blake in Africa, so if you guys wanna go check out Blake's page, he does have the YouTube, Blake's Exotic Animal Ranch, as well as Birds and Exotics of the World. That's gonna be on Instagram, but you guys can see some of the stuff that they did in Africa over there. So hippos, elephants, giraffes, lions, the whole nine yards, they did a lot over there. I encourage you to go check that stuff out because I had a good time looking at what they had posted. So, Lewis brought me this guy today. He's on his way to transfer this guy back up north. This originally came from a Steve and Jelly stock. Uh, a buddy of ours, John Heidecker, does a lot of work with Steve and Jelly. I don't know if I'm supposed to be putting that out there. I'm pretty sure it's safe. But I love Steve and I love John. Those are both two really, really solid guys. Very nice people. They will give you the time of their day. If you have questions, if you need anything, I've had plenty of help from both of these guys, and then John himself is just overall will literally give you the shirt off of his back. Uh, Steve's the same way. He will spend hours with you on the phone that he doesn't even have uh, in order to get you where to, you know, to where you need to be. So back in the day, there was very little people producing, reproducing the heloderma as a whole. Heloderma is all of your venomous lizard species. That's your beta lizards and your gila monsters and all the subspecies there within. If you want to talk about venom delivery systems, this is very much opposite of what we have for our venomous snakes. The venomous snakes keep their venom sacs on the back of their head. Um, some of those have rear fangs, some of those have front fixed fangs, some of those have front fangs that can actually walk around like your vipers and stuff like that where they can actually individually move those fangs, tag you from the back. Some like the stiletto snake can actually poke those out to the side, the wacky side to side. These guys have a delivery system much different. All the venom is kept in the lower jaw. Every single tooth, might, it's not like a snake where they have two individual teeth and they're gonna give you a calculated dose. The venom in these guys is the hemotoxin, predominantly hemotoxin. It's not used to subdue their prey. Other animals use that venom to subdue their prey. These guys use that specifically to increase or to cause as much pain as humanly possible for any predators that they may have. It's a slow moving lizard, they're ground dwellers, they come out very rarely, you know, just a little bit in the morning, they'll get what they need as far as their thermoregulation, and then back to the burrows, and then they're pretty much coming out like dusk and dawn type of scenarios there. Um, this guy in particular, high peach, you can get these colors all from like the darkest of orange that you could possibly imagine, all the way to nice peach, and then this one itself is a bandit gila monster, where you have your reticulated Gila monster as well. Now, this is gonna go into, I'm not gonna, we'll do another episode on Gila monsters themselves. We'll do another episode with the Beta Blizzards as soon as I have the permits here and I don't need Lewis, my babysitter, stopping by with it. I do appreciate that he did bring it by because he was on the way and wanted to check out the house. But this kind of goes into what I'm gonna be doing today as far as like how to tame your animals. Now, I wouldn't suggest to anybody out there at all, this is a venomous animal. There has been no reported deaths, but if you had underlying issues, if you were allergic to the venom, if you were a small child, an older person, if you have health problems, there is always that chance that something goes wrong. So just because there's been no reported deaths doesn't mean that it can't kill you. Now, one this size obviously isn't going to, isn't going to be able to produce as much venom as the adults themselves. And if you get closer, you can uh, see this guy's like a little tiny guy. And you can already see, like, he's there. Usually when they get bigger, they kind of tend to chill out. And we're going to feed this guy right after this because he seems to be a little piggy. But you can see he's already going back and forth doing the attacking thing. So what I could do is do, like, a lot of people and just yank him right behind the head. And then I'm safe. But what that does is every time I come in here, one of two things is going to happen. If I own this lizard and I repeated this process where every time I open his enclosure obviously this is just a tote for move to move him from one side to another this would have to be set up 
in an enclosure with a temperature gradient, the same as you guys saw my beaded's way back when, if you look at that episode where we have that temperature gradient from 75 all the way to 95 for a hot spot. That's how we would set that up in a much larger enclosure. For the transport bin, you have to have a lockbox. So we have the one lockbox, and then this goes inside another lockbox, and then that lockbox actually gets zip tied and then actually manually locked with actual locks with the big venomous thing on top. I should actually probably show you guys that. So if you're transporting it, you have to have a permit, number one in Florida, 100%. They've broken them up into families, those permits. It used to be a venomous permit. Now you have to have five different venomous permits to be able to have different families of stuff. So you have like your shoe vipers, then you have uh, lapids, that's all your cobras, coral snakes, things like that. Um, then you have your colubrid stuff, which would be a lot of your rear fang stuff, uh, crates, things like that. Is the crate? Yeah, I wanna say the crate is in the colubrid family. Uh, mangrove snakes would definitely be in that. And then you have your Eulodermas. Um, so it's five different categories that you have to get. So before it was 1,000 hours for your venomous permit, now it's 5,000 hours, unless you do the test and break it down. If you take the test that they offer from the state, then you're breaking that down to 500 hours a piece per permit. Now, I have my general permit. I got it when I was about 18 years old, so I've had a venomous permit for a long time. And this is one of those things where, like I said, this is not for everybody. I wouldn't recommend um this for everybody else but for me i especially when i want to get my stuff tamed down like if you take a shot from this guy it's definitely not going to feel good it's not going to be like it's adult counterparts that's so going to hurt a lot more and he's actually looking for it so what i do instead of grabbing him up behind his head the more restraint that i apply on an animal the more the animal is going to feel threatened so it's just a basic understanding and he's still pissed off. And I don't have any rodents on my hands, but he's definitely smelling and looking around, trying to figure out what's going on. He's trying to take a shot. So I keep my hand open. I'm trying to get him to chill out, relax, be a little bit more comfortable. But if I restrained him, immediately he's gonna open that mouth. And then if I came in here day after day, and grabbed him behind the neck, then of course it's gonna turn around and bite. Now, over time, this relationship would build to the point where he would know that obviously every time I come in here, number one, I'm not coming in to feed him every single time, and then number two, I'm also not coming in here to, to, to cause him any harm. And not that it causes anything any harm, there are certain situations where you do have to then grab something behind the head to keep yourself safe. Um, that is a real thing, I don't, Discourage anybody that does it if you catch your animals like that as long as you're doing it safely and keeping the animals safe Knock yourself out now. So for the you know, so if, I mean, let's just be honest ladies and gentlemen It's a venomous lizard. This could cause a lot of damage it could cause you a really bad day one this size or whatever Obviously isn't gonna put you in the hospital, uh, but even if you went to the hospital There is no anti-venom for these things It's just uh, the hemotoxin and the proteins inside are made to cause as much pain as they possibly can so that whatever it is they bite in the wild, they're obviously gonna scare that animal away. It's a lot of pain and it's instant, it's instantaneous. We'll go into a bite story. When I get everything set up and I have my venomous permit here and I get my beaded lizards back here, we'll go over a couple of bite stories that I had with these guys in particular. So you have to be really, really careful and you have to respect the animal for what it can do. So even though it hasn't caused deaths, you still wanna treat it for what it is. It's an animal that carries uh, a venom inside its mouth and that's coming from the bottom jaws. Every single tooth on the bottom is grooved. So what you can do is you can handle these guys with gloves. If you do have gloves on, much different than like a snake. I'm not talking about the big Kevlar gloves. You can use a regular glove and what it'll do is generally speaking, if you get bit with a glove, it will still hurt. You're still gonna get a little bit of the venom inside there, but it keeps most of the venom on the outside because it's basically soaking the venom in the longer they hold on. And they do have incredible draw, uh, jaw strength to be able to hold on very tightly and hold on for a very long time. And then you don't wanna harm the animal either, so you don't wanna literally yank him off. You could break a neck, you could break some, t I mean, if some teeth go, some teeth go, but if you break a neck or something like that or damage the animal altogether, then you really just want to know what you're getting yourself into. So this would be like an expert level reptile, 150%. You got to know what you're getting yourself into. It's extremely dangerous. They are very sweet. It's my favorite uh, lizard. Mm, I'm going to separate the two. Favorite gecko, favorite lizard on earth. Easy guy. So basically what I'm doing is I'm letting him do his own thing. 
And for me, this is the easiest way to get an animal to tame down. And I'm gonna use that lightly. I'm gonna let him back. Go ahead, bub. Go ahead, big guy. And you can see he's still trying to shoot around, but I don't want to stress him out too bad, so we're gonna put him up. He's brand new and he's also going somewhere else. He's going to a brand new home. And I'm sure the person who's getting that is going to enjoy it because I'm a little jealous myself. Now, this one I do own, and there's a massive difference here, right? To me, this is like the most underrated thing on earth. This is the coolest gecko that you could possibly ever have. People don't get these things for very simple reasons. They're cheap, they come in often, they're not an extremely rare animal, and they're dicks. They're straight dicks all the way through. If you can get a baby and raise it up, they are gorgeous. I wish this guy wasn't stressed out right now, but I moved him from the garage to the inside. Um, I could keep him in here technically. I could absolutely do that. I would have to have a light on top. I would block some of this off. I do have a piece of bark that goes towards the back. And unlike a lot of people, what a lot of people will do is they'll put that cork all the way to the back and they'll form fit it to fit the cage so that the back of the cage isn't glass and it makes it look nicer, it gives it bark. What I like to do is keep the bark about an inch and a half off the back of the glass and give them a little place to go in because these lizards where they come from, and it's most of Southeast Asia, um, they're a lot like the geckos that we have around here, these little Mediterranean house geckos that we have running around, which by the way are asexual, so they're parthenogenic. The geckos that we have around here, they never have to breed with anything else. If they lay eggs, those, legs, those eggs are fertile. So little Mediterranean house geckos that we have running around the state of Florida, um, those guys, those house geckos, like I said, parthenogenic, they lay eggs, those eggs are fertile, they don't have to mate with any other animals or anything like that, they're just constantly producing more and more geckos. These are a little bit different, but they do kind of have the same traits as the smaller guys that we have running around here. If you're from Florida, and you know when you walk outside at night around any light where the moths are going or anything like that's going around, the insects are going around, you're gonna have a few geckos hanging around in that area. And these guys have kind of adapted to a similar form-fitting way. They do come from the rainforest, like they're often found in the rainforest, and they're, they're all over the place. If you look at the, the range that these guys are in like Southeast Asia, from Indo, all the way to, I want to say there's some even that have been found in Taiwan, maybe, maybe not. Um, but if you, if you do like specific research on these guys, and I did it um, a lot when I was younger, and I'll see if I can get some pictures that I can throw up too from some of the toke geckos that I used to keep. So this is a toke gecko. And there's a reason they call them a toke gecko. So the scientific name literally is gecko gecko. So gecko, the first one, the genus is G-E-K-K-O, where we usually spell gecko, G-E-C-K-O. So it's gecko, G-E-K-K-O is the genus. And then the species is gecko, G-E-C-K-O. So it's much like our green iguanas. Our iguanas here, the green iguanas, the scientific name is iguana iguana. So that's the genus and that's the species. So iguana iguana would be your green iguana. Now these guys are extremely robust as far as geckos go. I want to say that they're either the second largest or the third largest in the world. I think, I want to say the giant leaf tail gecko is probably um, your largest species, and that's a Europlatus. Those are the ones that are coming from Madagascar with those big, huge fan leaf tail geckos that we have. Um, these guys, however, much differently from the leaf tail geckos, you can already hear the noise. So, with the giant leaf tail geckos and most leaf tail gecko species, most gecko species, I would say, there are some out there that can inflict some damage. Most gecko species, even if they bite you, it's not really a big deal. The bite's not going to do much, especially the Europlatus. Those Europlatus, all those leaf tail geckos, they have a very thin jaw line. This guy has a very robust jaw structure, so when they bite, they bite for real. They can hang on, and they can hang on for quite a long time. I wish my dad was here to tell a story from when I was a kid, because that shit would be bomb. You guys would laugh your asses off. Now, I think one of my favorite parts of this lizard is that there's so many different names. Like if you look up all the names that they call these things uh, from where they come from, there's a reason for it. If you go, and I don't know if I could put a call up there because they might copyright me for that, but if uh, a toke gecko obviously can make noise. 
So that noise right there is just a defensive noise. In the wild, what these guys will do is they'll do this little mating call and it sounds like they're saying toke, and it sounds like they're saying gecko. It sounds like they're saying a lot of things depending on what you have in your brain already. It's kind of like that mind trick where if you're thinking something and somebody repeats something and it sounds similar to something else, if you're thinking that, they do it on the damn Instagram all the time. Oh, whenever you're reading, it's going to read whatever, but it's just what your brain is telling you what you're reading versus what you're listening to. So the sound that they make literally sounds like they're saying toke or gecko or my absolute favorite, and this is why even when I was a kid, so this was research when I was a kid, I haven't done a lot of research on them since, um, but when I was a kid, in the Vietnam War, you know what they used to call these things? The fuck you lizards. Dead serious, dead serious, so you can look that shit up, so they called it the fuck you lizard, because much like Toke or Gecko, fuck you, it sounds a lot like what they were saying when they were walking by. And that call is usually made, like we can hear him calling. This is a male. The males do get larger than the females. And there's a lot of conflicting information on the internet. That's why I tell you guys always to research as much as possible what you can research for these guys because you have such conflicting information. So when you look at the species as a whole and you start digging into their natural, uh, you know, their geographical range and then all the information put out, you see things that are like, yeah, it don't make quite, you know, some of it makes sense, some of it doesn't make sense. That's why I always say to like fact check, use different sources, try and get as many sources as you possibly can. Um, there are captive breeders out there. Oddly enough, you know, it's an easy species to breed, but like this guy is more comfortable in my garage. In the garage, it's hot, it's humid, it's always in the mid 80s, it's very humid in there. Inside here, I could replicate that, but why would I do that when I could just take that big ass cage that I have outside, set it up in the garage, I don't have to use any lights or anything like that, and he'll be much more comfortable there than he will be inside if the AC dries this shit out. That's why we have some of the animals that we have in here, like the bearded dragons, so we don't have as much humidity going on in there where the garage is just perfect for him. He'll be perfectly fine out there. So once we get him his bigger cage, obviously this is just a temporary thing and he's been fine in here for a couple of days, but I want to get him to the, you know, his bigger setup. But let me get to my lizard here now. Now I'm going to show you guys a couple of things. Like again, if I were just to grab him behind the head, he's already pissed off. He's already stressed out. This animal, um, I have only owned for a little while. Somebody dropped it off at Josh's shop and immediately I was like, I want that. And Josh was like, for real? And I was like, yeah, I want that. He's like, okay, well, then it's yours, just take it. And he's like, all you have to do is catch it because I'm not touching it. So I've had him for a couple of months and I've given him a time to acclimate. And what I want to do is I want to show you guys over time that it is possible to get an animal that is this defensive to kind of chill out. I don't like the word tame because tame would mean, watch this shit. All right, so, I mean, you saw what he just did there. So they will violently shake, and then here comes the blood. So the teeth are there. The jaw structure is there. If they don't want to let go, they won't let go, period, end of story. So there's a couple of different ways I can deal with this. I can run in and grab him. He's already stressed out because he sees a bunch of movement and shit. It is during the day. This is a fully nocturnal species. Not that it makes it better at night. It's not like he's angry because I woke him up. He's angry because he's a Tokyo gecko. This is what they do. They defend the shit out of themselves. And being such a large species with incredible draw strength. And then of course, we're gonna do a little alligator move here. Let me just move some shit out of the way and make this easier. So I'm gonna show you, I don't like to do this unless I absolutely have to, but I'm gonna show you the general thing that most people do is they will come in for the catch behind, come here bud. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna come in from the catch behind the lizard and they're gonna try and get behind the neck so that they don't get what just happened to me. Like look, I mean, you can see there's a lot of blood. So what they'll do is they'll come in and then they'll just quickly grab behind the neck. So obviously you've caught the gecko, hooray for you. And I'm not saying that it's a bad thing if you do it safely, but you can absolutely hurt. Big boy, why don't you come a little closer here? Oh, thank you, appreciate you. So, um, 
I'm not gonna say it's an extremely dangerous lizard, but I will say, like, if it bites you, like, the shit does bleed, it does hurt. If they get you by the cuticle, which would be my dad's story, and they hang on for a long period of time, that shit's gonna suck, it's gonna hurt. And uh, especially for small kids, you get one this size, you can do a lot of damage on a finger. It's not gonna take a finger off or anything like that, but you're definitely gonna have some crying kids. I wouldn't say this would be a good beginner animal unless you get a little baby. If you get a little baby and you can find a little captive born baby, these are amazing animals if you raise them up. That doesn't mean that you can't get a big guy like this that's angry to chill out. So over time, we're gonna do these videos and I'm gonna do it with him and I'm gonna show you the difference in behavior. And I don't do this every single day. So today will be the first day that I start. But what I'll do is I'll relax and I'm gonna put him in a position where I want him to feel a little bit more comfortable. I don't want him to feel restrained. So then what I'll do, and the reason why I brought him in here, obviously, is because in the garage, there's so many different places where if he wants to jet off and go, then he can do that, and it's gonna be a lot, of, it's not like I would lose him, but at the same time, I'm gonna have to move a bunch of shit around, and I'm gonna have to make a lot of time to get his ass back where he needs to be. So you can see the demeanor has already changed. Like he's still opening the mouth because of Mr. Camera guy with his big ass beard in front of me, but uh, other than that, as soon as I let them go, and as soon as I give them the time, and what I'll do is if they want to move, I'll just let them move on their own. So if he wants to chill, he can chill. If he wants to move, he can move. And then just light touches, light movements, I'll get them comfortable. And then what I'm gonna do is just sit here and spend the time. And that's what it takes, ladies and gentlemen. Honestly, this is all it is, it's just spending time. Now this is gonna take probably the better part of a month to two months and it'll take me seriously working with this guy every other day i say every other day because i don't even though this is one of the hardiest species of gecko that you could probably get they are ironclad this is an animal built to survive built to survive all types of different scenarios they do great in the rainforest but if you go over to like indonesia and shit these guys are climbing on the walls they're just like our geckos here. They're very well adapted to living in city areas. Why? The geckos are sitting up on, on the high ledges. As soon as the lights come on, they got plenty of insects. And, uh, you know, so they, they've adapted to city life. They've adapted to their, um, obviously, where they come from from the first place and the uh, rainforest over there. But he's very dark right now. What you guys aren't getting to see is like every little tiny gray spot that you see, like these little bands and then all the dark gray on back, it gets to be a very, very vibrant, bright, bluish gray rather than a dark gray. So you can tell he's stressed out. It's very easy to tell when some of these guys are stressed out. Much like the Cuban night and all, green and alls, iguanas, toke geckos, a lot of lizards do this where immediately when they're stressed out, they just go straight dark. So these guys can handle the stress a little bit more than some of these other animals. So there's some animals that you can go right into and start working with. There's other animals that you want to acclimate. This guy, I could have probably started working with a while back. I like to let all my guys acclimate no matter what. And we just moved, we've been moving shit around. He's obviously doing well. He's, he's a bulky mofo, like this is a big guy and he's still got some room to grow. Um, but he can do some damage. But as you can see, like he's a lot less apt to turn around and try and bite or do anything as long as I don't have him behind the net. He's still got his mouth open. He's still gonna let you know like, hey, I can do what I can do but he's not actively going for it. Even the Gila monster down there, which babies are a little bit different with the Gila monsters. They're always full of piss and vinegar. They have to be because obviously it's a tiny little animal. They're very slow and then they can't get away from predators too fast. So their best defense is literally to spin in that circle, much like an alligator, and continue to protect that circle until it can bite whatever it needs to bite. The Toke Gecko is a little bit different. It has the ability, and we're gonna go deep into this in further episodes, but I'm not gonna bore you guys with what well, doesn't bore me, the science behind what goes on. Everybody thinks they have little sticky feet and stuff like that. When we get into why these things can stick themselves into a wall, it literally gets into the science behind the pads of the feet, what's in the pads of the feet, what goes on with the pads of the feet, and we'll get into all that stuff just because I thought it was super interesting as I was growing up. So I have a lot of books on these guys. Um, and then, like I said, I'm gonna try and show you guys some of the pictures because I did have a large project going on with Tokyo geckos. There are morphs out there. I think they're gorgeous morphs, but they are rarely reproduced. So we do have albinos. <coughs> we do have pies. 
We have leucistic, we have granite, we have patternless, and I was holding uh, a lot of those for a long time and really couldn't get any production, which was very weird because they do really well here in Florida, but I just couldn't get the conditions right. I literally moved them into the garage hoping for some production. Never really got it from the stuff that had more stuff going on, but I produced the shit out of the normal ones. Not sure why. Not sure if there was something to do with like a genetic quality that I was missing, but put some normal ones together, getting babies all day long. They do say that the toke geckos protect the eggs. That is something that I would disagree with. There are some reptiles that do protect those eggs. Uh, king cobras protect their nest. Alligators, crocodilians, those guys protect their nest. As far as after that, like you have your python species and things that will wrap and incubate their own eggs. So I would say that those guys do protect their eggs. But as far as most reptile species go, generally speaking, motherhood goes as far as like we're having live birth or we're laying eggs. As soon as we have live birth or we lay those eggs, that's it, motherhood is done, that's it, we're done and over with. These guys actually, if you kept them in an enclosure, it's funny because you have these crested geckos and crested geckos breed and if you leave them in the enclosure to hatch, a lot of times the crested gecko, once they see the baby pop out or whatever, they may pop and eat that baby. The toke geckos seem to do that less. And the reason I say that is because with my crested geckos, when we had like 180 of them, I would pull the eggs out. And if there was an egg left in there that wasn't laid in the, in the egg box itself, you could see the, active, the, the geckos actively going for babies. So we would peel those out. With the toke geckos, we usually have a big uh, cylinder bark where they can get into, they feel safe, it's tight on all sides, so I bury that on the floor, and they would usually lay their eggs in there. Their eggs are a little bit different than crested geckos. Crested geckos are laid, you can pull the egg out and put it into an incubator. These guys, you would have to break the pieces of bark off to put them in an incubator, and on top of that, I can leave them in the garage and just let them incubate on their own, because unlike your Rachidaclis or your Europlatus, those guys are laying eggs that are a solid egg. You usually get two eggs, one to two eggs, and then you can literally take those out, no problem. These guys will literally lay one to two eggs, but they glue it onto the side of whatever it is. So as opposed to the shell of like a Rachidaclis egg that's a little bit more leathery, um, these guys do have a hard shell on the outside. So it's a hard shell on the outside. You can't peel the eggs off because you will break and crack the eggs. So I think more so than them protecting the eggs, I think what it is is they lay the eggs where they feel the most comfortable, where they feel the most comfortable is usually where they sleep at night. Even in the wild, they're gonna go back to their same little area, they're gonna have their small territory, and if they live inside of a, uh, if I can, why is my brain not allowing me to think of what Rain gutters, like if it lives inside a rain gutter or if it lives inside an electrical box, it's usually gonna go back there. Uh, towards the end of the night and that's its safety quarters. So it's usually gonna spend most of its time in there. It'll find a nice spot once it's got a secure spot. Like if you pop an electrical box open in Indonesia where one of these guys live, usually you'll see like 40 or 50 eggs. A bunch of them hatch, some of them not, but they'll spend their time in there. I don't think it's so much them protecting their eggs more than they lay the eggs where they're comfortable and they're also spending their time in there. So it kind of gives the perception of, okay, these, these animals are protecting their eggs, but they would sooner eat uh, a baby token egg gecko just like anything else. But you can see we've been talking now for about five minutes. He hasn't really made any moves. Half of it is stress. So don't get it confused, ladies and gentlemen. We didn't just tame a toke gecko down in 30 seconds or less. That's not how it works. He's stressed. He sees Lewis walking around here. Lewis is a bird. And then he's also taking in his surroundings. And we haven't done this work yet. So he's absolutely stressed. You can see from his color. So he's chill. He looks chill but he's still gonna bite the shit out of you. What I'm looking for is over the next two to three months tops, I wanna show you guys that by doing this, by allowing the lizard to kind of move around freely instead of having it, look, he's gonna try and take a shot, which is fine. And if you do it this way, there is fair warning, ladies and gentlemen. I am not going to lie to you in any way, shape, or form. You are going to 100% get bit. That's gonna happen. So if you're uncomfortable with that, Get yourself a pair of gloves or whatever, but even a pair of gloves isn't going to stop him if he crawls up your arm and bites you in the tit or bites you in the side or bites you in the face. He's not going to give a shit. If he can take a shot, he'll take a shot. Period. End of story. So, uh, this is the way that I tame my animals down. I, myself, I, I, you know, I'll take a bite. I don't give a shit. It doesn't bother me. I've been bit by far worse. By far worse. I'm not telling you guys 
to take the bite. But for me, taming down any wild animal like this just takes time, dedication, and you wanna have that time be positive on both sides. So if every time I go into that cage, I just go in there and grab him behind the head like that, um, he's never gonna tame down. He's always gonna be on guard every time I get near that cage because he's gonna think that I'm gonna come in there and slam him up. So what I'll usually do, and I'll do this one more time before we put him up so he doesn't get angry too much. I don't want him to get a bunch of shit in his mouth either. Look, watch, watch, watch. Ba, 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 ba. All right, so now what I'll usually do to pick this guy up instead of grabbing him behind the neck is I'll, or you can grab me first, is what I'll do is I'll keep a flat hand, I'll keep my fingers basically closed so he can't grab any specific fingers. I give him a flat surface. And then what I want to do is I want to get underneath them if he lets me. And then I will slowly get him up and I'll scoop some of this dirt with me because why not? And then once he gets comfortable, I'll pick him up that way. That way, he doesn't have to think every time I come in here, I'm gonna straight slam him behind the neck. So yeah, am I gonna take some shots? I just did, took a bunch of shots. But at the end of the day, after a couple of months, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see that this animal will no longer be afraid of me reaching my hands in here. It makes it a lot easier for me to clean and he's gonna have a larger enclosure, which makes it a little bit more difficult as well. So the smaller enclosure will help for two reasons. Number one, it's close quarters. I don't have to chase him around. He doesn't have to be stressed out being chased around a bigger enclosure. But once he gets in that bigger enclosure, it'll be easier because he's gonna be less afraid of me going in there. What I'll also start doing is I'll start trying to hand feed. So I'll go in here and I'll grab a bug, a cricket, a roach, a pinky mouse, whatever it may be, and I'll get him to start trying to come over to me. That'll make him a little bit more comfortable and he'll realize, okay, this guy's not so bad. He's feeding. Now, do I think that there's any particular relationship as far as he's gonna love me in the future? No, there will be a working respect where there will be a mutual thing where I respect him and I don't want him to hurt and then he'll respect me to the point where he's no longer gonna waste his energy trying to attack me because he knows I'm not gonna do anything to him. And that's basically for me, not for everybody. Please don't take this as a, everybody do this because if you're not willing to take a shot, from one of these guys and it does create blood. They do have sharp teeth and that's not even as bad as it can get. You know, they do shake back and forth. They're a lot like an alligator, but what you saw is on the lighter side of things. If this dude decides he wants to grab and not let you go, he ain't letting you go. And you can put a credit card in his mouth and stuff, but usually what that does is you're gonna damage some teeth. You may break a jaw, you may break something on the lizard. So I usually take the bite. The best thing to do to get, a, if you do get bit by one of these guys and they are hanging on, the best thing to do is put the lizard back inside the enclosure, let all of his feet touch the ground. Once all of his feet touch the ground, he may shake on you a little bit, but then he'll usually let you go. Whereas if you're trying to pull and pry and get his jaws open, the chances of him opening it is slim and numb because he's gonna feel more defensive and he's gonna want to bite even more if you're working on trying to get it in the opposite direction. Now you can see he's starting to lighten up a little bit. I think he's starting to calm down a little bit. Again, not tame in any way, shape, or form. We didn't do it in 30 seconds. It's gonna take a couple of months worth of work. I'm gonna give him a day off every other day so he doesn't have to stress out. And obviously I'll spend a lot more time than just this little video here. Usually about 30 minutes I'll give it, and then I'll put him back in his enclosure. Give him a day, the next day, another 30 minutes when I find the time. And then I'll start stretching that out more and more. If I see that he's overly stressed within that 30 minutes, I'll put him back in his cage. Remember, it's about the animal, it's not about us. We want the relationship, but you have to build that over time. So if you see that he's overly stressed, obviously go ahead and put him back in his cage. Let him reconfigure, do smaller amounts of time, just try and keep your animal stress level very low. For some species, like if this was a chameleon and you were trying to do this and trying to get your chameleon to chill out, chances are you'd kill your chameleon. Overly stressing some of these animals can kill an animal. It can allow all kinds of different things to happen, which we'll get into on a later date. But these guys are hardy enough to take it, um, but you still have to watch out. As hardy as they are, you still have to watch out for the safety and well-being of the animal. But what I want you guys to see is over the next couple of months when he chills out, this dark gray color, remember this, and we'll come back to this because I'll save it, but this dark gray color 
is gonna change because once he's comfortable and he knows that I am not here to hurt him, what he's gonna start to do is when I get in here to get him, he's gonna be all white. The spots are gonna be much brighter gray. He's gonna be way more vibrant. He's gonna look like a gorgeous little gecko. Not that he doesn't look gorgeous right now. And speaking on that, that's another thing that if you read, like I took a little, all right, so you see how you bit and then you just kind of let him go and he'll do his own thing. So you're gonna get tagged up. You're gonna, it's gonna happen. Like if you're doing it my way, that shit's gonna happen. Not a lot of people are comfortable with that, but I can guarantee you one thing, cause I've done this since I was a kid. These are the lizards my dad used to get me to work with on a constant basis, that and Nile monitors before like Nile monitors were even on the spectrum of being banned. They were the meanest little assholes you could possibly get. And my dad used to get these for me because he knew that I liked, as a kid, when I was young, um, I took so, so many bites. I was constantly covered in bites. But my dad knew that I didn't want the animal that uh, everybody else wanted because it was tame. I wanted the animal that nobody else wanted. I wanted the animal that left, you know, was left in the pet store for months and months and months because he was extremely aggressive. And my dad got to the point where he would finally get these things for me. And if he wouldn't get them for me, I would usually bring them home from Marco Zeno or Filippo and my boys from back in the day that I still talk to to this day. Uh, that did all this stuff with me and I would bring him home anyway and I would get in trouble and then after getting in trouble my dad would usually set him up in a nice little condo and uh, he knew that I liked working on that spectrum he knew that I liked the aspect of taking an animal that is not overtly aggressive he's doing it out of defense he's not doing it because he's just an asshole that feels like he wants to beat everybody up he's doing it because he's afraid so remember that ladies and gentlemen these animals are afraid of us. A lot of them are afraid of us. So when you see these things, a lot of people like to use the word aggression. I don't like to use the word aggressive. Uh, aggression. They're not overtly aggressive. They're defensive. You don't see him charging after me. He's not going out of his way to attack me in any way, shape, or form. He's simply sitting there now trying to figure out what the hell's going to be next. And what's next is we're just going to kindly close him in his enclosure. I'm going to move him back downstairs into the garage outside where he can get his temps and his humidity the way he wants. We're gonna get him fed up for the evening. We're gonna give him a couple of days and we're gonna keep doing this. And I'm gonna film it over time. So we're not gonna do a video every other day on Tokyo Geckos. But over the next couple of months, I'm gonna take a couple of short videos when I do this stuff. And then when we get him to where we wanna be, I'm gonna show you the difference between what he is now and what he is in a couple of months. So, hope you guys like that little episode. These guys are my favorite. So the you lizard, ladies and gentlemen, one of my favorite on earth. There you go, gecko, gecko, choke gecko. And if you want to learn some more about these guys, please, I suggest you do as much research as possible. Um, one common misconception is that you can go online and you can look for a captive care sheet and you're going to get all the information you need from the first captive care sheet that you see. But the reality of it is, ladies and gentlemen, is like I said many times before, Google is not an answer engine, it's a search engine. So if you search something, it's going to put you with like-minded individuals with like-minded questions. So what you're going to do is you're going to get your outside sources, I suggest books. Somebody in the comments also brought up the fact that you have to be careful with the books that you read. I have books downstairs that are so far out of date that some of the subspecies and some of the species individually aren't even called what they used to be called from the books that I had. A lot of those books I got from my father. Some of them I got from Dr. Clarsfeld when he got rid of his book collection and a lot that I picked up over time. But that information changes too. It's science. Science is consistently changing when certain scientists see certain things. So you got to be careful with the information that you get and you got to kind of like source as many sources as you possibly can, find the commonalities, find what makes sense, put that shit together, and then get your own bit of research rather than going on YouTube to find out what it is you're looking for. Not even me, not even your favorite YouTuber, I don't care what it is, if you're getting an animal and you wanna get into it, do the research yourself, I promise you it's worth its weight in gold. It may take a month or two, may take four months, depending on how far you wanna get into it, but I suggest always, 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 always take whatever captive sheets that you get, take whatever captive care programs that you see that are put out by people like me or anybody else for that matter. It's the 
And it, literally anybody can have an animal for two months, feel like they're ready and qualified to write a care sheet and tell other people how to take care of those animals. And that's the information that you're gonna be reading. And you don't know if that person's been doing it 20 years or 20 days. Either way, they can put that information out. So take everything that you can and then always research the animal in the wild. The biggest tell and the biggest amount of information that you're gonna to get to keep your animals healthy is to figure out what the hell they have going on in the wild. Climate, agricultural zoning, how cold does it get during the winter? How hot does it get during the summer? How do they spend their days? What's the most information that you can get of an animal in its natural habitat? And how can you as an individual keeper create within an enclosure or however it is you keep your animals, how can you make it as close as you possibly can to what the animal gets in the wild? That's where you're gonna get your gold. Not from the care sheets. Some of these books are fantastic. Some of these care sheets are fantastic. But if that's not paired with the general information of what this animal has in the wild and what it needs in the wild and what it goes through in the wild, none of the other information means anything at all if you can't pair it with what goes on in the wild. Because if somebody's telling you that this gecko species right here needs to be indoors, dry, all that stuff or whatever, somebody could have it and just throw that information up and it's completely opposite to what it actually needs. So if you research that, got that information and then research this guy in the wild, two opposite things, then you can cut out this care sheet, okay, this doesn't mean anything. Get this care sheet, okay, this doesn't mean anything. Now you have like 10 or 20 different care sheets, a couple of books, and you know what's going on in the wild. You can take all the pertinent information and everything that adds up, and then you can take whatever anomalies that you see and you can kick that shit right the fuck out and get it out of your way and make sure that your animal's safe. All right, there we go. That's taming a lizard. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, tame does not mean that even when the animal is good and workable, that he's not going to turn around and bite you every now and again. That's always, always, always going to be an issue. So be careful with what you're dealing with. Remember, Tokyo Gecko, not exactly a beginner thing, unless you can find a little baby and raise it up. And if you don't spend the time with that little baby, it's going to turn out just like that. You may raise it and feed it well, it may do well, and then when it's that size, if you go to pick it up and you've never handled it before, you're going to get the exact same reaction out of a captive born baby. So if you're a younger kid or if you're a parent that's looking for something for a younger kid, probably not the way to go. But when I was younger, this is what I was given to me from my father. So I'm not going to completely say that no kids can handle this because I was four, five, six, seven years old when I was taming down my Tokyo geckos. And I had an army of these guys that were all fairly tame. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope this episode makes it out. It's only the 10th time I've done this. I appreciate everybody's waiting and everybody's patience. Thank you guys for my Patreons. I don't know how to do any hyperlinks. Brian's not with me on this one, so there's going to be my editing. Apologize for it ahead of time. And then as well, I can't hyperlink anything, but thank you all. Thank you to my Patreons. When the sun rises, when the sun